Um, thank you so much, everyone, for coming today. Our country is, its we got a lot going on, so we're going to talk about a lot of things that are important to a lot of people here in our community, as well as, you know, constitutional norms and, and you know, what the impeachment process is about. So um, let's see if we got everyone up here. Got everyone up? That's right. Keep. Uh, we need. We need. The, we need the tea and the inquiry. So someone grab the tea. Please. So as you know, we're spelling out some stuff so people can actually see the branding and know what's going on. Um, we're here at the Illinois State Capitol steps. Um, citizen action, impeachment inquiry now because we're concerned about what's happening with the president of the United States. So if I can get everyone to get set and to get quiet, we'll get started. Okay. Okay, everyone, if I can have your attention, if I get the speakers line up here um, on the side with me, I want to thank everyone for showing up today. Um, it's super important. There's a lot of uncertainty happening in our country. Um, I want to welcome you to the shadow of a courageous president Abraham Lincoln, we stand here today because we call on Congress to open an impeachment inquiry. And specifically, my name is Scott Cross. I'm the co-coordinator for Indivisible Illinois, part of the Springfield uh, Indivisible Leadership Team. Uh, we host this event in combination with Resistor Sisterhood. And I just want to say to everyone, please give a shout out to Resistor Sisterhood. They've been amazing. Um, we want to welcome you and thank you for your solidarity in coming here today. There's a lot of people throughout the country and throughout the system that are scared now to even stand up to this president and what's happening across the country. But we're not scared here today, are we? No. Hell right. no. These are uncertain times. As our country, you see immigrants are being treated inhumanely across the country. So not only what's happened in the Mueller report is bad, and you're going to learn more about that today, and we're going to educate the community, and we're going to talk about why impeachment inquiry should happen now. But also remember all the moral things that are happening around this country, the attacks on freedom of speech, the attacks on the, the right right here to assemble peacefully. Uh, there's so many things happening. So I just want to say, we need you out there that's on social media, that's watching us today to pick up the phone. We need you to call your members of Congress and tell them that the time is now to open an impeachment inquiry. They need your calls, right? Yes. It takes the people to get the elected officials to do your duty. Remember, they work for us. So I'm going to start out today with just a call for unity. Uh, Martin Wolf is he served the Abraham Lincoln Unitarian Church for 16 years. He's been an active in various interfaith activities for social justice groups within the Springfield community. He is someone who cares about this community, Martin Wolf. It is an honor to share this day with you. I am accustomed to preaching, and yet the signs behind me speak of impeachment. So this is a grave time for all of us. And in my tradition, we say that revelation is not sealed, it is open. That truth, however hidden, will be discovered and revealed. And so I would offer us words of encouragement and to recast the words from Ecclesiastes from long ago for something to inspire 21st century activists in this nation. And so for everything, there is a season and a time for every purpose under the heavens. There's a time to refrain, but also a time to reframe, a time to yield, but a time to persist, a time to rest, and a time to resist a time to cringe, a time to be courageous, a time for patience, a time for action, a time for prayer, a time to apply pressure, a time to reflect, a time to react, a time for posting on Facebook, and a time for protesting on the streets, a time to whisper, a time to honk horns, a time to shout, a time to comfort the afflicted, and a time to afflict the comfortable. A time to crave justice, and then a time to pursue justice. A time to cherish the status quo, a time to change the status quo. 
a time for differences, a time for dissent, a time to acquiesce, a time to accuse, a time to challenge, and a time to hold those who are criminal and evil accountable. Amen and blessed be. Thank you, Martin. I think at times like this, you know, we all draw on whatever our spirituality is or lack there of spirituality that guides us in a higher power because there's a moral guide in this country, a moral fiber that I believe that we're losing under the command of this administration. And every day that they eke away at the, at the, you know, the freedoms that we have is, is a day that we must take a stronger stand to say no. Um, and with that, I want to introduce to you uh, Rachel Elizabeth. She's a member of Resistor Sisterhood. She's a part-time actress, general theater nerd, and a mom of protest chewinis and other animals. Welcome, Rachel. Thanks, Scott. Um, yeah, I'm Rachel. Uh, that is Boots and Snoopy. They got a they got a lot to say today. So before I wrote this speech, sorry, am I too loud? Am I not loud enough? Good. Before I wrote this speech, I actually went online to research what impeachment is because I feel that there's a lot of misconceptions about what it is because apparently we all pass our constitution test and then forget the entire thing. So impeachment is not removal from office. Impeachment is bringing charges against an official. Impeachment on a federal level has to be brought up by the House of Representatives and will be tried in the Senate. It's been described in a 2016 congressional report that impeachment does not need to be brought up because of criminal conduct. They identified three types of behavior that are grounds for impeachment, and I quote, improperly exceeding or abusing the powers of the office, behavior incompatible with the function and purpose of the office, and misusing the office for improper purpose or for personal gain. The first U.S. president to be impeached was Andrew Johnson in 1868, <laughs> mainly for violating the Tenure of Office Act, which was during the messy Reconstruction era. Uh, Andrew Johnson was not convicted and removed, but this did set a precedent that Congress cannot remove a president just because they don't like his politics. It, con it solidified the congressional power in the United States. Impeachment proceedings were actually started against Richard Nixon in 1974 for the Watergate cover-up, but before the articles could be brought for a vote, Nixon resigned. The most recent president to be impeached was Bill Clinton in 1998, who was brought on charges of lying under oath and obstruction of the investigation of sexual misconduct, not the conduct itself. So it's the lying, not the misconduct. Of course, Bill Clinton was not removed from office. So altogether, three impeachment proceedings against U.S. presidents have been started, two have gone to trial, and zero have resulted in removal. In this case, people may ask, why would we bother to impeach Trump when it's likely not going to result in his removal from office? There's one word for this, precedent. If we do not bring Trump up on charges of impeachment for calling for foreign interference in U.S. affairs, we send a message to leaders in the future that this is okay. If we do not bring Trump up on charges of obstruction for his attempts to block the Mueller investigation, future presidents will think that they also have that power. If we do not... Oh, okay. Excuse us, we have to move the steps, so give us one second. Um, can someone grab this for me? We're just moving this the steps. Here, sir. Hit, sir. Hello. Sir. Hello. Sir. Hello. sir. Hello. Is this okay hey, let's right get, here? Let's get no, this guy. I have to go down onto, um, onto uh, the public sidewalk. It's okay. It's okay. Yes. I'm here. Yes. Hi. <sighs> My apologies to um, Rachel for that, but he said we had to, we couldn't even wait till the end of the, the speech, so go ahead. Okay. So, if we do not bring Trump up on charges of, of impeachment for calling for foreign interference in U.S. affairs, we send a message to our leaders in the future that this is okay. If we do not bring Trump up on charges of obstruction for his attempts to block the Mueller investigation, future presidents will think that they too have that power. 
If we don't bring him up on charges of profiting from the presidency, more rich men think that they should run our country for their profit. If we do not impeach Trump, we are sending a message that the president is above the law. I don't want my president to act this way. I don't want my nephew and my boyfriend's son and my young friends to think this is how you act when you have power. My sister is a substitute teacher and she's already told me the way kids act when they see this in power and they see their parents supporting it. That is not how I want the future of my country to act. We must let there be consequences for actions that are unfitting to our laws and our democracy. Whether we think the Senate will convict or not, this is a dangerous weapon if we let it slide. So on that note, I leave you with some words from my favorite movie, Rogue One, and this is from the Rebel Jinn. What chance do we have? The question is, what choice? Run, hide, plead for mercy, scatter your forces. You give way to an enemy with this much power, you condemn the galaxy to an eternity of submission. The time to fight is now. Yeah. What did you say? The time to fight is now. The time to fight is now. Okay, I'm going to read some chants here for you real quick. Love not hate makes America great. Love not hate makes America great. Love not hate makes America great. The people united. The people united. The people united. Thank you, Rachel. I really appreciate that. I mean. Trump uh, has really done a lot of bad things, and even though we had this little mishap with the, with the state uh, Capitol Police, we're going to keep going because democracy sometimes can be messy. But that's what's great about democracy, right? Yeah. It's about individual voices wanting to be heard, turning out in their communities to change this change this state. I'm going to go ahead and have, where, what time, where are we on time? Okay, we got time. Decent. Okay. Heather Dykes. Come up, you're a long-standing resident of Springfield. She's a wife, mom, human resource professional. She's also the founding member of Resistor Sisterhood, our partner. I could not have gotten this done without the help of the Resistor Sisterhood today. Um, thank you, Heather. Uh, so she likes to focus, Resistor Sisterhood is a group that focuses on fighting oppression and corruption in all forms. We are pro-women and men, pro-choice, pro-family, pro-civil rights, and pro-true democracy. Heather, take it away. Woo! The reasons for wanting Trump out of office are many, but that can be done via the election process. Starting impeachment hearings is the only way to uncover as much of the truth about Trump's collusion and obstruction as possible. Basically, how do you prove someone has committed a crime when the person continuously ignores requests for information, outright lies, and coerces witnesses to do the same? Oh, and that person just happens to be President of the United States. I think Elizabeth Warren said it best during her CNN town hall, so I'm just gonna give you her speech with a little bit of my own flavor thrown in. So when asked by Cooper Anderson, what do you say to Democrats who think impeachment isn't a voter priority and could jeopardize the 2020 election? Elizabeth Warren responded with, to that, I would say there is no exception to the United States Constitution. To keep it simple, there are three basic reasons that really stand out from the Mueller report and should be a warning to all citizens, regardless of their political or other beliefs. The first, a hostile foreign government attack our a hostile foreign government attacked our 2016 election with the purpose of helping Donald Trump get elected. The evidence is clear, you just have to read the report. The second is that Donald Trump welcomed that help. It was a sophisticated attack. They hacked more than 50 computers at the DNC. Again, just read the Mueller report. It was also documented that the Trump campaign had a worked out formal process for handling leaks related to the Russia investigation. Part three is that when the federal government started to investigate parts one and two, Donald Trump took repeated steps aggressively to try to halt the investigation, derail the investigation, push the investigation in a different direction, and basically keep the investigation from going forward and turning serious, including his own personal involvement. 
my take, they, he knew that the more they dug around in the stable, the worse the stench was going to get. Here's how I see it. If any other person in this country had done what was documented in the Mueller report, they would be arrested and put in jail. But Mueller believed, because of direction from the Justice Department, that he could not bring criminal indictment against the sitting president. I don't believe that's correct, but that's what Mueller believed. So he serves the whole thing up to Congress and basically said if there's going to be any accountability for his actions, it's going to have to come from Congress. And the tool that Congress has given for ensuring accountability of the president is the impeachment process. This is not about politics. This is about principle. This is about what kind of democracy we have in our United States. In a dictatorship, everything revolves around protecting the one person in the center. Not our democracy. Not our democracy. Not our democracy. Not our democracy. We have to understand our place in history. We have a duty to protect our democracy not only now, but also when the next president comes in and the next president and the president after that. And to those who still insist that he's better than any Democrat, Donald Trump only cares about you so much as you can get him more. More money, more power, more fame, more chances to lie and evade and get away with it. If Donald Trump was poor, living in a rural area, had no title or status, do you really think he would be the kind of neighbor to help you out? No. Without holding it over your head or trying to get something in return? No. Just out of the goodness of his heart? Really? I'm going to end with a quote from Robert F. Kennedy. Every time we turn our heads the other way, when we see the law flouted, when we tolerate what we know to be wrong, when we close our eyes and our ears to the corrupt because we're too busy or too frightened, when we fail to speak up and speak out, we strike a blow against freedom and decency and justice. I want to remind Reps Rodney Davis and Darren LaHood and all representatives, regardless of the state or what side of the aisle they're on, they ultimately represent all citizens of the United States. As such, they have the sworn duty to act as guardians against the other branches, Woo! including the executive branch. I call on Davis and LaHood to read the Mueller report and support an impeachment inquiry. Thank you. Heather, thanks everyone. Again, we definitely want to call on Representative LaHood and Davis to tell us and to tell the news media and to tell the people that they represent. Have they even read the Mueller report? Because I can tell you only 3% of the nation has read it and the 3% that have read it are scared. They, when they read it, they are dumbfounded by the things that it says. People in our own group said, I had to like, I had to like look, is this real? And so we need people to read the Mueller report. It's one of the things we want to we want to push everyone to do today. If you have not, because when democracy is under attack, what do we do? Stand, Stand up, up, fight back. back. When democracy is under attack, what do we do? Stand, Stand up, fight back. back. When the Mueller report is under attack, what do we do? Stand, Stand up, fight back. back. When Trump thinks he's above the law, what do we do? Stand up, fight back. That's right. I'm going to introduce you now to someone who's been standing up and fighting back for quite some time. Uh, her name is Jessica Motzinger, and she's a mother who served eight years in the Navy, and she's been, uh, her husband is retired military now. And he's in Tulum. Yep, and he's been, she's been through. Afghanistan again. Yep. So she knows a lot about this, and she's also a leader of Indivisible Metro East, but she wants to talk about an oath, because, you know, military people take an oath as well as the people in Congress. Go ahead, Jessica. Woo! I do solemnly swear or affirm that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same, that I take this obligation freely without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion, and that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties of the office on which I am about to enter, so help me God. Yeah. This is the oath that every elected senator and congressman takes every single term. These, every enlistment or term, they take the oath. It is a solemn vow 
not just words. Since 2001, in over 20 countries, we have combat operations. Men and women all over the world are willing to sacrifice all in defense of our nation and the oath that they took. Yes. Those men, women, and families that they leave behind depend on their elected representatives to be faithful to our nation, constitution, and to those troops. We, we depend on them not to abuse those very lives that they command. We criminally punish those military members who fail or refuse to uphold their oath. It is our duty now, here and now, to demand that our elective representatives, like Representative LaHood, Representative Bost, and Representative Davis and Shimkus, act to uphold their oath. Congress should not be allowed to shirk their duty. Yeah. We must demand that Congress open an impeachment inquiry now. They are currently derelict in their duty. The oath that they took states nothing about doing what is politically expedient. It demands that they do their duty to execute the laws faithfully, to defend against all enemies, foreign and domestic. We know that Russia attacked our elections in 2016. Yes. Our intelligence agencies tell us that they and others are still attacking us. Yes. But what is Mitch McConnell and the elected Republicans doing about it? Nothing. Not a damn thing. And as a matter of fact, they're standing in the way of us doing anything. It is our duty now, here and now, it is our watch to demand, to demand that they absolutely do their duty to us, our nation, and our Constitution. Thank you very much. Wow, Jessica, inspiring. Um, I want to introduce you next, Troy Gorda. He's our next speaker. He's the president of the Greater Springfield Democrats in Sangamon County. Troy Gorda. Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming out. When I was first asked to speak, I was a little nervous because there were so many things to speak about. Uh, I, it's so easy to get scattered. When, when you're talking about this administration, there's so many things that uh, offend our sensibilities. We uh, don't seem to be able to get a handle on one before the news reports another. Uh, and it seems that every new scandal is an opportunity for this president and his administration to deflect, deny, to lie, to twist, and torment us with a false reality, which is something he has spent his life selling. I'm calling on every American to please read this report. The Russian attempts are clearly exposed and detailed. There is, the amount of detail in this report will shock you. You will be very surprised if you take the time to read all of the things that have been revealed by this investigation that's been labeled a witch hunt. As I say this, impeachment should not be easy. Impeachment should be hard. I'm okay with that. We can't allow it to be used or not used because it's not politically expedient. It is a constitutional responsibility and it is up to us, the people, to demand that it take place. One of the conclusions of the Mueller report, I always screw up his name, I always try and think of the E, but uh, the Mueller report, excuse me, one of the conclusions that he draws is because you cannot charge a sitting president, it would be unfair to poor Donald Trump if we charged him with things where he could not receive a fair trial. This is a blatant call for the impeachment process. The impeachment process will create the trial. An investigation does not mean that you are guilty. An investigation can absolve you, as can a trial. We must undertake this process. The Justice Department and the FBI have constantly been under assault by the con man in chief, whether he is to call them liberal. When he can't, he will refer to them as the deep state. The deep state is a term that was created when they could no longer ascribe the motivations of those people to a political process. This term ignores that the investigation had 19 attorneys, five from private practice, administrative staff, and over 40 FBI agents. All of them would have to be colluding together 
to stop who? Donald Trump. There's one man that has been benefiting from this entire process. Nobody else benefits. During the special counsel's investigation, the president publicly declared innocence while attempting to undermine, stop, or change the focus of the investigation. He never once considered that an investigation could actually exonerate him. He never once stood up and said, when we were running for president, we were attacked too. We were, they were attempting to manipulate us. His whole demeanor has been to deny that it even occurred. The report details the efforts to undermine the investigation. The president then tried to get his White House counsel, Don McGahn, to instruct the Justice, Dispar the, excuse me, the Justice Department to dismiss Mueller, and then went so far as to attempt him to release a false statement denying that the president ordered him to do just that. Luckily, McGahn refused. The White House counsel had more substance than the sitting United States president. During this investigation, through public comments and intermediaries, the president has encouraged those under indictment to stay loyal, dangling the possibilities of presidential pardons and help to all those who are loyal, not to the United States, but to Donald Trump. Lavishing Flynn and Manaport with praise, as well as Michael Cohen, until that close confidant turned into the president's words, a rat. I would like to also point out that one of the reasons that Michael Cohen is in jail today is for lying to Congress. What is that lie? What lie did he tell that has landed him in prison? On November 29, 2018, Cohen pled guilty to lying to the Senate Intelligence Committee and House Co Intelligence Committee in 2017 regarding the proposed Trump Tower Moscow deal that he spearheaded in 2015 and 2016. This lie that he sits in prison for today only benefits the President of the United States. I hope that you will take the time to read this report. I hope that you will take the time to become informed and share your information with others. I would remind you and hope that you look for a brighter day, which is in our future. We can overcome this, but we must stand up, we must be patient, and we must inform others. I want to thank you for your time, and I look forward to our next speaker. Thank you, Troy. Um, you know, we are a community. We are a nation. We are a community of, of concerned citizens, and that's what I think this is about. It takes us speaking up, everyday citizens saying that they're tired of what's happening, and that's how we make change happen. Um, and I'm really, really excited for our keynote speaker that came here today. Um, it's so important that we have a voice that really can speak with knowledge and, you know, breadth about this subject. and. Uh, so Ronaldo Mariotti is a former prosecutor and a CNN analyst. He's also the legal affairs columnist for Political Magazine and the host of On Topic Podcast. Renato is a progressive activist and a longtime indivisible member who fights for the rule of law and the protections of our elections. Please give me a big welcome for Renato. <laughs> Wow. Oh, thank you. Thank you all for coming out uh, when you could be doing other things, right? It's always easy um, to honk. It's easy to honk your horn. We've heard some people doing that. It's easy to uh, click a like or tweet something online, but it takes um, some real action to get off your butts, to get together, you make your signs and to come out here and to start doing something. And it takes some real guts to go out there and to call your representatives even if they don't want to hear what you have to say like uh, representative LaHood for example mm -hmm. um, but that's what it takes to change things and what I want to talk to you about as a starting point today is we heard a lot about reading the Mueller report like well get your representatives to read the Mueller report we should all read the Mueller report I will tell you a lot of people uh, when I talk to them are like oh my god it's so long I tried reading it it's 400 and something pages long and I thought I would tell, tell all of you about the time I first read the Mueller report and what I saw in it. Um, it was not in the, the way, context in which you're reading the Mueller report. I was at the CNN studios, uh, and I had to figure, I had to read this quickly. I was told, read this quickly, you're going to have to go on the air later today. My, my, my editor was saying, you got to write a column about this. Analyze the Mueller report today. <laughs> so I'm sitting there going through this, and you know what I, I turned to? I turned to the section on obstruction. 
because I had read that letter by Attorney General Barr. And I will tell you, by the time I, the Mueller report was released, I knew he was being deceptive because there was a, clearly enough out there to see the guy was working on Trump's behalf. But I thought there's no way this guy would come out and say that there are difficult questions of law and fact about obstruction of justice if they're not there. And I wanted for myself as a lawyer to see what those difficult questions were. And I was shocked to see that there weren't difficult questions really that were presented for much of the, of the uh, obstructive acts that were there. In fact, what happened was there was a case that was meticulously laid out by Robert Mueller of how the President of the United States had repeatedly obstructed justice. And before we get to anything else, I want to talk to you very, very briefly. I won't, I'll just take two minutes of your time to tell you what that is because I want all of you to understand what is in that report because I know it's hard to see it. Uh, there's a lot of pages there. Look, obstruction of justice is when you try to undermine an investigation with the intent to do so. And what did Trump do? Trump literally tried to fire Robert Mueller. And he did that after his own attorney, the White House counsel, told him that if he tried to fire Mueller, he put it in writing, if you try to fire Mueller, they're going to use this as evidence of obstruction of justice. Now, I'll tell you, ladies and gentlemen, if your attorney tells you that if you try to do something, it could be a crime, and you go ahead and do it, that's pretty good evidence that you want to commit a crime, right? It's got common sense. Trump knew he was under investigation. In fact, the day before he tried to fire Mueller, he tweeted out that he was under investigation. And what did he do? He called up Don McGahn. He told him that Mueller, quote, had to go. He had to go. And when, when McGahn didn't follow through, McGahn just blew him off. Uh, because he knew that that would be wrongful. He was a attorney who was not going to get involved in that. Trump called him up again. When is this going to happen? Call me when you're done. Call me when you fired Mueller. Call me back and let me know. And what did McGahn do? McGahn prepared to resign. He told his assistant that he was going to resign, his chief of staff, that he was going to resign. He started telling other people he was going to resign. He wasn't going to do this. Now, McGahn stayed in his job, but just so we're clear, you don't have to be a successful criminal to be a criminal, okay? You can commit a crime unsuccessfully. It happens all the time. I put people in prison for unsuccessfully committing crimes, and that's what Trump did there. The second thing he did is he literally reached out. He, Don McGahn, uh, his lawyer, had told him that you could not, could not interfere in the FBI investigation, could not contact the DOJ, and he wanted to interfere with Mueller. So what did he do? He called up can't literally cable news commentator Corey Lewandowski to try to get Corey Lewandowski to get Jeff Sessions, then the Attorney General, to limit and roll back the investigation. I mean, you, can you believe that? He did it because he knew that if he called Sessions himself, he would violate what his attorneys told him. He thought he was being clever. He told Lewandowski, tell Sessions that Mueller can only investigate future elections, not what happened in 2016. Like, that makes any sense at all. How do you investigate what will happen in the future? I never heard of that in my decade as a federal prosecutor. I'll investigate future crimes. Um, but nonetheless, that's what he said. And he told Lewandowski that if, if Sessions refused to meet with him to tell Sessions, or to, to discuss this, to tell Sessions he's fired. Uh, Lewandowski tried to contact somebody else about approaching Sessions. He felt uncomfortable with this. He took the written document that he had, where he took notes of what, what Trump wanted, put it in a safe to keep it because he knew it was important. And then Trump followed up with him. Why haven't you done this? What, what did Lewandowski do? He went to an aide who was close to Sessions. The aide's like, I am not having anything to do with this. And nothing came of it. Again, why did Trump, why did Trump fail to limit the investigation? Not because he didn't have the power to do it, not because he didn't repeatedly try, but because he was so incompetent that he wasn't able to get it done. Incompetence does not save you from a criminal indictment or a criminal conviction. I put a lot of incompetent pr criminals in prison. That doesn't save you. And what is the third thing Trump did? Perhaps the worst thing he did is when he realized that all this failed, when the New York Times um, published an article explaining that he had tried to fire Mueller, when I, I had written a column at the time saying Trump, I, it's now likely that, that, that Mueller will conclude Trump obstructed justice. This is in early 2018. What did Trump do? Trump, first of all, tried to get McGahn to deny this, but he couldn't deny it. He refused to deny it because it was true. And so then what did Trump do? Trump tried to get him to write a false letter, a false document, documenting 
a falsehood that he had never been told by Trump to fire Mueller. Trump knew that was false, and he knew that it would ruin him as a witness. If, if somebody's a witness against you and you get him to write a sheet of paper lying about what you did, of course, then you could, your, your lawyers could use, you, use that against him in a criminal trial. It's common sense. We all know it. To McGahn's credit, he refused to do it, and Trump was mad. Trump said, you didn't, I didn't say that. And, and McGahn says, I take notes. I took notes of the conversation. I, was, I remember I was there. You told me to, get rid, to fire Mueller. And Trump says, I've had a lot of lawyers like Roy Cohn. They don't take notes. And what did McGahn say? McGahn said, real lawyers take notes. And he's right about that. I'll say that as a real lawyer. So look, all of this together, all of this together is overwhelming evidence that Trump engaged in a scheme to obstruct justice. There's no question in my mind that if Trump was not the president of the United States, that, in, that he would be indicted and convicted for obstructing justice. No doubt in my mind at all. And, I, and that is why I, was, I wrote uh, with, uh, with a friend of mine, I wrote a letter and, we, and worked together with a lot of other folks and got over a thousand former federal prosecutors to sign a statement saying just that. Now, I know a lot of you are, are thinking to yourself, why, why are we here, why are we doing this? Because you've seen the unprecedented stonewalling and obstruction by the Trump administration, I know that for some of you it's disheartening. And the reason I know that is I'm an indivisible member. I go all over the state and I talk to people who are doing what they can. And it's, it can be disheartening, it can be frustrating at times. And I want all of you, when you're thinking about whether any of this is worth it, I want you to think about something that happened this week. Because a Department of Justice lawyer got up in front of a panel of federal judges. I used to be a Justice Department lawyer myself. And she said things that I cannot imagine anyone saying. She said that, literally, that children who didn't have soap, who didn't have a toothbrush, who didn't have a bed to sleep on, were not subjected to unsanitary conditions. How could anybody say that with a straight face to anyone, much less to federal judges, a, a lawyer who has a responsibility not to make a false statement, who has ethical obligations? It's disgraceful. But the bottom line is the stakes here are as high as possible. And it's going to be very easy for all of us to go and watch the latest movie, to go out drinking with our friends, not only in the months to come, but in the, in the, in the year ahead to come, as, the, as there's elections for House and for President and things like that. But for, for Christ's sake, you don't want to look back years from now, a decade from now, and look back and say, I could have done more. I could have done more. I will tell you, when I was a young man, and I was in law school, I was at Yale Law School, and I saw the election results from Florida, and that uh, George W. Bush won by 600 some votes in Florida, I thought to myself, if I took a few weeks off, I could have convinced 600 people to change their mind. Maybe I could, maybe I couldn't, but the point is you never want to do that. You've got, so what, is, what does this mean? We have to get off our asses in the weeks yeah. and month and year to come. Yeah. Call your representatives, call Darren LaHood, call Boss, call these guys and tell them they should read the Mueller report, they should take action, they should take action to hold this president accountable, period. And, and not only that, you can defeat some of these people in elections. I, there is no question in my mind that Rodney Davis can be defeated. He almost was defeated last time. There's a lot of work to be done. So I, what I want to ask is for all of you together with me, will you do everything possible to fight against Donald Trump? Yeah. Yeah. Hell yeah. So let's do it together. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we're so glad to have you here and your voice added to this because um, it's it's... You know, being an indivisible coordinator across the state of Illinois, people are scared. They're scared because they're going to turn on a list. They're scared to like things, and they're scared to show up in public because of the oppression and the stuff that's happening in this country. And we want the people that are watching there today, they're scared to say, come to the streets and welcome. You're welcome to come with us. We love this country. We love our communities, and we care about the rule of law and that this country is a moral country, that we are about equality, we are about justice, and, and, and you know, really... We're about ending income equality. We're about really looking at America and asking what government should be. 
that's what Indivisible is about. Really quickly before two, uh, before we let up, there are two um, citizen speakers that wanted to speak real quick, and we're very big on letting citizen speakers real quick uh, speak. So first, Pat Curtis, she's a member of the Springfield Indivisible. Thank you, and I'm not gonna take much time. I couldn't resist, I asked Scott, because I, we were all witnesses today to what I call the supreme irony that would be funny if it weren't so tragic. While we were here and assembled today, under the statue of Abraham Lincoln, we had an, ind an individual representing law enforcement, and I'm not disparaging him, I'm sure he was doing his job, asking us to move off the steps. We did. I don't know the local laws. I'm assuming there's a law or municipal law or statute that says that you can't assemble on the steps without a permit. I don't know. But we did it. We didn't like it, and a few of us had some comments, but we did it. Ironically, while we were doing that, we were discussing the President of the United States, who every day breaks law after law after law, and who we can't get people to answer subpoenas. Repeatedly, we have asked people to testify. So the irony here that I couldn't resist, and I said, Scott, we got a comment about this. We followed a law that probably, and it's not an overwhelming law, it wasn't that big a deal, but we did it. While we have the administration of the United States blowing us off completely and has determined that this is not, in fact, a nation of laws. We need to be reminded of that. One more comment. I did read the Mueller report. It took me a long time because it was so depressing, so scary, that I would get upset. And I, went, I usually do my reading at night. I couldn't sleep because I would lie there and say, I can't believe this is happening to our country. Please read it. You will not believe what the President of the United States does on apparently a daily basis. Thank you. Great speech. Um, I want to thank you so much for that so uh, tie into what just happened. We do obey the law. We do care about the law. We care about having good relationships with the city and the police and the fire department and all that stuff. So I always tell people, Indivisible, if you haven't found a home, check out a local Indivisible chapter in your area um, or a grassroots chapter like Sister or Resist Resistor Sisterhood. It doesn't matter what the grassroots group of branding is. It's just that you get involved in your community. One last uh, community uh, citizen speaker, Jim Jeske. He's also from Springfield Indivisible. Come on. My most appreciative audience right there. Uh, thank you, everybody. I just wanted to stop one minute and share a little story I had to share with my grandkids recently. Talking about why didn't something get done years ago. We are talking about Hitler. Why didn't somebody stop Hitler? Why didn't anybody do anything about Hitler? Why can't we get a time machine and go back and kill Hitler and start all over again? Well, what I'm telling you is we don't need a time machine. We need to fix our problems right now in real time and get this done with an impeachment process started because that's the only way the truth is going to come out here. We do not want to be sitting there looking at my grandkids saying, geez, I didn't do anything because uh, I had a hangover that morning or I had bone spurs. I couldn't get up and come out and do anything. Uh, we don't want to do that, so I'm just telling you, everybody stay together. If we stay shoulder to shoulder, we can be a road grader and scrape this crap right off the face of our planet. Fight, everybody. Stay good. Stay strong. God bless you. Solidarity. Thank you. Solidarity. Show me what democracy looks like. This is what democracy looks like. Show me what democracy looks like. This is what democracy looks like. Let us take that ideal, the values of equality, and let us stand up stronger, more matter of fact against untruths, against the fake news. And I need everyone here today to call Representative LaHood at 202-225-6201 and to call Representative Davis at 202-225-2371. 2371. Great, I didn't have the sign to go on that. And call Representative Boss and Representative Shinkus. Call them every day. It's like you get up and you say, hey, I just want you to know I believe that you should, um, you should support Representative Tlaib's bill to open articles of impeachment. Will you do this? Um, and then and answer your reasons why. So I don't want to take up much more time of everyone here today. I want to thank you for coming, but I just want to make sure that um, you can write letters to the editor. 
you can um, reach out to your community. We need more people talking about this, but most of all, put the Mueller report in front of anyone and everyone that you can, because once they read it and they open their eyes to the truth, it's a profound change that people have. So if someone tells you that they don't believe that Trump should be impeached now, what is your first question? Have, have you read the, have Mueller, you read report? the Mueller report? And if they haven't, get them to read it. Thank you so much. Thank you for everyone coming today. We greatly appreciate all of our speakers. God bless you all. Keep up the fight.